Gentlemen, the captain will say grace. For what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thank you. Please be seated. Face. Great chieftain o' the pudding race, I bin them all you tack your place, pinch thrive for thir. Well are you worthy o' a grace as langs my arm? The groaning trench are there you fill, your herd is like the distant hill, your pin would help to mend the mill in time of need, while through your pores the dews distill like amber bead. His knife see rustic labour dight, and cut you up with ready slight, trenching your gushing entrails bright like any ditch, and then, oh, what a glorious sight, warm, reeking, rich. Horn for horn they stretch and strive, deal tack the hindmost on they drive, till all their wheel swallowed kites belay are bent like drums, then all good men may slight to rive, be thank it hums. Is there that hour his French ragout? Our only O that would stow us soon, our fricassee that would make us spew, with perfect scorner looks down with sneering scornful view on sick a dinner. Poor devil see him o'er his trash, as feckless as a withered rash, his spindle shank a good whip lash, his neave a knit, through bloody flood their field to dash, oh how unfit. But mark the rustic haggis fed. The trembling earth resounds its tread. Clap in its wally neave a blade. He'll knack it whistle. And legs and arms and heads will sned like taps a thristle. Ye powers why make mankind your care and dish him up his bill of fare. Old Scotland wants nae skinking wear that yowts and lies. But if you wish her grateful prayer, dear a haggis! <laughs> your thoughtfulness in writing as you did, and in return, sends her best wishes to all concerned for a most successful event. Oh, uh, very kind, uh, very kind. Uh, very kind. Uh, you are now on a ten minute break, comfort or otherwise, before the prize giving and other proceedings will start. So, see you in ten minutes. What? Oh, the dinner foursomes. Robert.
Let's all be out for that. David Jones is playing. In front of you, there's a little paper. Sign up the little so piece of paper. Sign up now. Give them to Robert. Uh, we have four things to do. Uh, we have to recognize the prize uh, I have to... Well, I think we've done pretty, pretty well, that, I think. Uh, yeah. We have to recognize the prize winners. Uh, I have to get out of your way. Uh, you have to listen to the new captain and uh, I'll get So that's what we have to do. First of all, I'm going to go to the other end and help Robert administer a new version of the prize giving. Oh, uh, thank you so much. And if it doesn't work, it's Robert's fault. <laughs> and if it does work, it's all good. Right, gentlemen, in a departure from the normal process of how we give out the prizes, it's going to be slightly different tonight. In the hope that some people, and you have already had a voucher put in your placement uh, today, don't come up here. Uh, you're only runners up. The captain doesn't want to shake your hand. <laughs> to give them a round of applause for very nearly winning the competition. <laughs> so the Wadia Cup, runners up, Chris and Richard Gottlieb. <laughs> the, 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 the Grant Govan Salver, Samir Nanji and Sean Dainty. <laughs> Challenge Cup and the Bairn Challenge Cup, Jamie Burridge. Yeah. Yeah. The Wimbledon Town Salver, Tom Bolland. Yeah. The Silver Shield and Captain's Prize, Sebastian White. Yeah. The Royal St George's Cup, Samir Nanji. Yeah. James Angus Yay! and the Pierce Dish Paul Marciandi. Well done to all the runners up. Now to the main prize giving, gentlemen. I am going to call these up in blocks. So if I read your name, I'm going to do it in a order, and there's going to be like four or five of you at a time, and then come up, and the captain will present you with your prizes. So the Wadia Cup was yes. won by Alex and Jamie Burry. <laughs> the Grand Kevin Salisbury was won by Chris Cotler and Elliot Brown. <laughs> the Guy Johnson Trophy was won by Tony Dundas and Ian Morrison. Yeah. The Awesome Dinner Plate Foursomes 2015 was won by Tony Donovan and Michael Chu. Yeah. And, the, and the Spring Dinner Foursomes Rams Horn this year was won by Malcolm Fortune and Michael Chu. Thank you. 
Yes. I'm going to read out a list. Some might even say a litany of prizes. And if you could just all listen to this and then give the recipient one almighty round of applause. The Bertie Horn Challenge Cup, the Bombay Challenge Cup, the O'Sullivan Dish for the lowest net junior in Springer Austin meeting, the March Stapleford, and the William Williamson Challenge Bowl, all won by Barbara Hack. <laughs> and David Jones by the most 
It was Mike, Helene, and Joe Conley, and they did it three and two. Your Dean, sorry, Dean Red Hughes. Red Hughes, yeah. If if somebody has got two envelopes and they're they might say Joe and Mike's names on you learn after a while. And the worst moment is when you've been speaking to somebody for about 10 minutes and you've no idea who they are. <laughs> and somebody else comes up towards you and you've no idea who they are either. And you have to introduce these two people <laughs> to each other. So I, I adapted the sort of, do you two chaps know each other? Sort of line, and hopefully they'd introduce each other and I'd learn both their names. Now, this fell apart halfway through the year at the Stokesbury Giving and Max charity day. I was in the bar having breakfast, talking to James Davis, who I played golf with on a Thursday morning regularly, and somebody approached us. So I said to them, Do you two chaps know each other? Yes, Simon, that's my brother. <laughs> <laughs> and I did know him very well, actually, as it turned out. So that was the end of my subterfuge with them. Uh, on a slightly more serious note, uh, I've really enjoyed. Uh, working hard with Greg and the Green Committee this year. It's been a big project uh, on the course. 
Uh, we're hoping we leave behind a strong foundation for future captains, main committees, wing committees, uh, for all the work we've done. So my, just a quick so thank you to Greg in public. Thank you. He's taken the strain. And, uh, on his holiday in South Africa, uh, Greg, my English is occasionally a little bit flippant, and uh, he objected to the phrase taking the strain. And so I had to send him a whole note about public school tug of war um, <laughs> of business, where the guy at the front is taking the strain. And I remember Greg saying, I'm not at all strained, Simon, I'm perfectly all right. <laughs> uh, so I had to send him a bit of stuff about taking the strain and its leadership, which is what he showed us. Anyway, thank you, Greg. Well, that's great. Yeah, great. Right, so that's the end of, the end of my year. Now, you know, I have, I have a belief that if the club is moving forward, uh, that's a good thing. Now the House Committee has done a lot of work, finance guys have been really under control, the Green Committee. And if you don't move forward, in general, in business, or in clubs like this, you go backwards. So I'm very pleased, I think, we're on the sort of front foot. And the only thing that could go wrong is that you choose uh, the wrong captain. Which brings me to my third point. <laughs> John Hyatt, what can I say? A man for all seasons? A polymath, a philomath, some with eclectic interests, an experiential omnivore, <laughs> multifaceted, multifarious, some with a large hinterland of interests, renaissance man, here we are. You get the idea. And anyway, it's not just cricket and golf with your new captain, so you'll get a much wider spread over nights like this than you've had from me. And he is the second captain in a row to have married their childhood sweetheart. Oh. Apparently, the past captains have said this is not, this is not a condition for future captains. Where is Richard John's a side talk, happy capper, runs around the course uh, like a hare. Uh, I wish you a long and hopefully straight drive on Sunday. Um, I remember the advice that, that a previous captain, who's sitting right in front of me, David Morgan, had for, gave for me. Legend. He said, uh, oh, he, he said, pay off the bloody piper for a start. <laughs> <laughs> you do not want to be walking 60 yards behind a bloke going half a mile an hour with a bag. <laughs> not good. And when you get on the first tee, you don't want to have any negative thoughts. He said, I had. 40 swing thoughts, all of them negative. So, put one positive swing thoughts, all you need. So, John, on behalf of everybody here, I wish you every success for the next 12 months. I'm sure you'll be a great captain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and also a number of red coats. My wife asked me, she said, who's that? And I said, I really don't know. She said, oh, well, perhaps they're the band. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, tonight I, I am indeed honoured, privileged and delighted to have become a fully paid up member. <laughs> <laughs> An interesting and, and no doubt diary crunching year lies ahead. Uh, the acting career is most definitely on hold. And gone will be the days when my wife would ask me, What are you going to do today? And I would say, I don't know, nothing. And she said, You did that yesterday. I said, I know, I haven't finished. <laughs> Of course, that's 
course, there's Sunday yeah. and the drive-in <laughs> to look forward to, as I'm constantly reminded. Indeed, it would be the best of times, it would be the worst of times. <laughs> <laughs> it's rather like Sidney Carton on his way to the guillotine, but without the companionship of the seamstress, even if the piper will be wearing a skirt. <laughs> <laughs> and with many thoughts going through his head, all of them beginning with don't. <laughs> In the theatre, one of, one of the great defences, and, and indeed protections an actor has, is that the audience doesn't know. Every production, every performance is different. All sorts of things can happen, and the audience will think it's all part of the production, but on Sunday I think it's different. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's no hiding place. I think you all know what's supposed to happen. <laughs> and although as my old friend John Desmond used to say, well, generally speaking, every shot pleases somebody. <laughs> Or might not be true. <laughs> and I can only hope again to echo the words of Sidney Carton. It will be a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. <laughs> God willing. Now, the most common question I've been asked over the past year is, are you looking forward to it? Well, I really don't think there's anything else to do. <laughs> of course I am. This is the most wonderful club. The best that I know. I cannot think of another one for which I even dream of joining. And every time I play the course, I think, what a lucky fellow I am to be a member here. To have had so much fun here, to have met so many good friends, often, as Simon intimated, without knowing their names. <laughs> or without knowing where they live, or what they do, or did for a living. And, and that, for me, is, is absolutely the soul of a good club. And forms, for me, the very essence of the enjoyment of being a member. And sometimes I feel the fact that there happens to be, just out there, are oh, the fine golf courses, just a glorious coincidence. <laughs> we welcome all comers who share our feelings of camaraderie, and, and we don't seem to take ourselves too seriously, do we? And even being able to introduce that faint hint of irony that separates us in these islands from the rest of the world. And that puts me in my... <laughs> suddenly got rather sort of fed up with this and he said, hey guy, he said, listen, he says, you English, you, you're all too damn stuffy. You would have stiff up a lip and this, that and the other. He says, you think you're better than us? He said, take me, for example. Take me. Look, I'm a little bit of Greek. I've got some Irish. I've got some Scots. I've even got some Spanish. I mean, what do you think? I mean, I'm just me. What do you think of that, eh? And the Englishman lowered his newspaper. He said, very sporting of your mother. You <laughs> 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 all know, you all know that regarding the course, some decisions have indeed been made. And as we all know, the, the road to hell is paved with flat squirrels who couldn't make a decision. <laughs> <laughs> we are embarking on a, on a grand project to make some changes and improvements that have become necessary as a result partly of inactivity over the last 40, 50 years, partly a result of new golf equipment as our members play in their 80s and 90s, and, and partly because we've got a green staff willing to take on these tasks and help us regain some of our Heathland heritage. This, this all started under David Morgan's captaincy, and so we can, we can hardly be accused of rushing into it. But we have engaged, as you know, one of the best, if not the best, of golf course architects, whose guiding mantra is always to ensure the maximum use of the natural and traditional look. And of course, I know you can't please all the people all the time, but I really do hope that while retaining our cult heritage, we will be able to produce 
that wow factor as we progress through the long term plan. Yeah. 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 And last on this subject, I was interested to note in someone's email that someone mentioned that the gorse, remember the gorse on the right of the eighth carry? Well, apparently it was one of the few places on the whole course where the ladies could find some gorse. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it being about as far from the facilities of the halfway hut as you can get. And that did put me in mind of a poem I came across the other day. <laughs> I must nip off for a pee again. If I don't, I think I'll die. And all I ask is a small bush, about four or five feet high. And a clear view and a quick slash. And a moment shaking. Light wind and strong zip. It's not forever breaking. <laughs> in this captaincy year. He was born on St. Valentine's Day. A birthday he shares with Michael Bloomberg, ex mayor of New York, Kevin Keegan, and curiously enough, the first porpoise born in captivity at Ocean World Flying. <laughs> He won a scholarship to Dulwich College, and such were his mathematical skills that the computer industry, then not so much in its infancy, more in swaddling clothes, in the shape of IBM, IBM engaged him and never for a moment regretted their decision. He moved from London to the US and then to Paris, where he acquired his love of fine burgundy. He's a remarkable man, for apart from being as we know, the best leg spinner never to have played for England. Yeah. He has combined his captaincy year with innumerable duties at Lords and the Oval with the England and Wales Cricket Board, the MCC, and of course his favourite charity, Chance to, Chance to Shine, under the auspices of the Surrey Cricket Foundation. He says that he worked for IBM for 37 years, but I've studied him carefully these last 12 months, and I'm absolutely convinced that this was nearly a cover for his real and undisclosed role as a member of the Foreign Office. <laughs> it is said that behind every successful man is an astonished mother-in-law. <laughs> now, whether this is true in Simon's case or not, I, I really don't know. I'll, I'll have to ask Lynn, but under his leadership, the ship is indeed steady. And thank you, Simon. You're going to be a hard act to follow, and if I do half as well, I will have played solid. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> as for myself in the year ahead, you'll have some idea of the sort of captain I'm going to be by when you realise that the only initiative which I've championed in any way whatsoever has been the members wine list. <laughs> I know I will have great support from Andy Bird, who will be standing here this time next year. And I've been blessed with the delightful Tessa Bake as my lady captain. We have a great team, as Simon said, in Robert and Richard and all those up in the office, in Sean out on the course, in Mehmet, Marie and Simon, front of house, backstage, and of course, David and his lads in the pro shop. I, I never tire of seeing Jack for his... <laughs> Um, golf is a game more of misses, and the guy who misses the least is likely to be the winner. And talking of hits and misses, I'm going to tell you another story. Now, I usually tell this story with the most graphic, action packed details, but there's not really a performance case. So. There's this guy hunting duck in New York, upstate New York. You've had it one. <laughs> and finally this duck comes over and he lifts his gun and he shoots the duck and it lands on the roof of, the, of a barn and falls into the yard. And he goes in to collect the duck and it's that night the farmer comes out. He says, uh, he says uh, what, do you, what do you think you're doing? He says, well, I just got to get the duck. He says, what duck? He says, that duck. He says, what do you mean that duck? He says, that's my duck. He says, that's not your duck. That's my duck. <laughs> he says, what do you mean? I shot the duck. He said, you, you may have shot the duck, but it landed on my roof and it landed in my yard. So it's my duck. He says, 
He says, listen, guy, where are you, where are you from? You're from the city, aren't you? Says, That's right. He says, I know you. You were from those guys from sort of Morgan Sachs or, 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 or Golden <laughs> Standard or something. He said, J.P. Morgan, actually. He says, okay, we're going to settle this country style. He says, yeah, okay, it's okay by me. He says, uh, how's that going? He says, well, I'll tell you what. He says, you stand just with your legs apart, and I kick you in the nuts, and then you kick me in the nuts, and then I kick you in the nuts, and the last man's when he gets the cup. <laughs> J.P. Morgan, give up on a challenge like that? Sure. The farmer says, okay, I'll go first. The bank is standing there, and the farmer steps back. Things, <laughs> <laughs> oh! Oh! <laughs> This is where the action's coming. <laughs> Use your imagination. <laughs> this goes on for five minutes. This goes on for five minutes. And finally, the banker gets up. He says, he says, okay. Fucking oh, fuck. He says, okay, my turn. And the farmer says, no, it's all right. You can keep the deal. <laughs> Now we come to the main event of the evening, which is of course the auction of the captain's car parking space. I'm serious. I'm serious. Look, there's a parking space out there that's hardly going to be used. Okay? The Triumph Bonneville is going to stay where it always stays, just outside the stocking room. Ken is even thinking of moving the side captain to just above the window. Just to confuse people, okay, they try to get the cars in there. Um, but if we could raise a little bit of money for charity, that would be terrific. I'm a, I'm a trustee of a charity called Dream Arts, which does performing arts for inner city kids, you know, mostly black, Asian, and I, I performed them occasionally. We did, um, we did Scrooge, Christmas Carol, though, there. it wasn't easy to tell, I mean, it was easy to tell which one was Scrooge. <laughs> anyway, uh, an email to the secretary. With your bid, we'll get the thing going. But I'll put a note in the in the in the, cap, in the secretary's newsletter about it. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. No, not an option. No, it takes too long. And that comes to our guest speaker for this evening, Sir Alan Yarrow, a former Lord Mayor of the City of London. The office of Lord Mayor instituted in 1189. Alan is the penultimate and 687th holder of that office. It rather puts the lineage of Robert and captains into perspective, doesn't it? Oh. A fishmonger, well, not, not, not a bit. <laughs> He's also a member of the Glaziers, International Bankers and Launderers. Now <laughs> Just the position of those last two wouldn't be lost on you. Yes. yes. But actually the family motto is Justus Esto et non metri. Be just and fear not. I think we ought to make a member of the Green Committee. <laughs> he was a banker with Climate Benson for his whole career and saw the most extraordinary change in the city in that time. And when I asked him if he would speak at this dinner, I wasn't sure what response I would get. I thought that he might be thinking that he's made so many speeches in his year of office. In fact, he made 850. And he had all this off. That he never wanted to give another one. But I couldn't be more delighted that he said yes. Thank you, Lord. And so, on a final note, before handing over, when you next think about the course, <coughs> and what you've seen and heard at the presentations, can I just leave you with the wise words of many a grandmother? I don't mind progress. Change, I don't like. <laughs> the toast is the health and prosperity of the royal women of God.
It reminds me of uh, July the 3rd. Uh, we were invited to go to the Carol King concert uh, at Hyde Park. And as I'm sure you all know, Carol King was a very prolific writer at the end of the 70s and 80s. And so we're quite excited to go. And we were sort of lying on the grass, having spent a lot of money on the wine, looking around the other people down, all over 60, and some looking incredibly shabby. But anyway, uh, we, were part, we were part of the same crew. And just before she started to sing, they had the Eagles. And I don't know if you remember the Eagles. Anyone here remember the Eagles? Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody remember Hotel California? Yeah. Does anybody remember the last verse of Hotel California? Yeah. The last thing I remember, I was running for the door. I had to find the passage back to the place I was before. Relax in the nightmare. We're programmed to receive. Yeah. Check out, but you can never be. <laughs> and this was the 3rd of July, a very Brexit. <laughs> no, actually, just a quick, a quick bit of context. Who is the Lord Mayor? Probably a lot of you know who he is, but I can tell you I didn't know when I became one. <laughs> and it was extraordinary. Uh, it, it's, it, it's bizarre, actually. It was the 800th anniversary of the Admiralty. The Lord Mayor Charter was passed in, in May 1215. Nobody trusted King John at the time, so then passed the Magna Carta afterwards. So it's also the 8th anniversary of the Magna Carta. And you might say, why am I saying that? I'll tell you why, because our son Max is disabled, and he's got severe learning difficulties, but he's a great guy, he's great fun to be with. And someone sent me a piece of paper, which was sent out by the Minister of Justice, saying, explaining how a person of special needs and learning difficulties, explains how they're innocent. I thought to myself, isn't that extraordinary? Strange irony. Here we are, the Magna Carta, the great Britain constitutes this country, all about innocent before being proven guilty. And we are going to the most vulnerable part of our society, saying, hey guys, you have to explain that you're innocent. And I built this into a number of speeches, and I thought, actually, this is very important, actually, because right the way through the whole of the thrust of what was going on in the law, was government was fighting against the idea of the presumption of innocence. Now this is quite a fundamental point. The reason why I'm telling you this is because it came right the way through at the whole year. That somewhere along the line, we were shortcutting everything on the anniversary of Magna Carta. Now every year we have a judge's dinner, and the judge's dinner is all the top judges come in, the appeal court and the Supreme Court come in, and the Lord Chief Justice addresses the troops. So I got Igor Judge in the year before, it was a year before, and I said, look, Igor, I need some help, because I want to know what I'm going to talk about. It's your, your, your flock, effectively. And he said, well, look, what do you want to talk about, Lord Mayor? And I said, I, tell you, I want to talk about the presumption of innocence, the irony of the anniversary of Magna Carta, that we are not any more supporting the idea that people are innocent until proven guilty. And he said, Lord Mayor, he said, you've already spoken three times about that. The government's got the message. You don't have to mention it again. And a sudden light bulb went in my head. I thought, good God, somebody's listening. And it was extraordinary. I had no idea the power of public speaking. And the reason why I say that to you is because I then went on to say to him, say, right, so what, what should we talk about then? What shall I talk about? He said, we'd love you to talk about legal aid. We'd love you to talk about the fact that the poor don't get the same justice as the rich. So we talked about the new lane. We had Michael Gove there for the best part of two hours. We actually thumped him, actually, with all the information about how unreasonable and how unfair the legal system has become. Because the judges, nearly all the judges, come through the criminal bar, and we are basically stopping that process from happening because no young barrister wanted to study criminal law because they weren't being paid. And that was a fundamental error of the system. That worked. Gove then started to move back effectively on the policy of what was going on with legal aid. The following day, on Monday, John Thomas came and said, Lord Mayor, can you ask one more favour, if you possibly can? So I said, OK, what's that? He said, we want to digitise the Royal Courts of Justice. So I said, OK, well, so make the case. I'm a businessman. You make a good case, return on investment, etc., ROI, all those. 
and make it simple so I can remember it, because I see the Prime Minister every 10 days, basically, roughly about every 10 days. It's at some convention or some, some reception. He made his case. I saw uh, Cameron in St Paul's at the Afghanistan celebration, and I made the case for actually digitising the Royal Courts of Justice. And he said, that's interesting. Um, I thought we'd already done it. I said, I thought you'd already done it too. So I followed up with a letter. And what people don't realise is that there's, in, the, in the city of London, the most important person in protocol terms is the Lord Mayor, unless the Queen's arrived. But the Prime Minister is definitely junior to the Lord Mayor in the city of London. So that means, effectively, you have an opportunity as the Lord Mayor to start pressing certain cases. I saw the Prime Minister ten days later and I said, did you get my letter, Prime Minister? He said, I thought you'd said all that. I haven't replied because you're going to hear from us in 10 days' time. In the autumn statement, Osborne made £750 million available for digitising the Royal Courts of Justice. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because nobody really understands the power of informal meeting with government ministers, etc. The Lord Mayor only dresses up 5% of the time. All you see is him waving his hat on his golden carriage. But I promise you, it is an extraordinarily powerful position. He's in 29 countries. You've already said already 850 speeches, but 29 countries. You're seeing Xi Jinping. You're seeing uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. You're seeing Clinton. You're seeing absolutely everybody. The ability to get your point across is phenomenal. You are treated literally like a king for the year. You don't carry a passport. You are flown everywhere by first class, you are taken off your plane normally by a motorcade, and you travel basically in the most extraordinary environment. All I can tell you is, I was hugely privileged to do this. Now, just occasionally, one or two things happened, which was slightly amusing. You have two and a half speechwriters, 850 speeches, you can't do them yourself. And my speechwriter burst into my room and said, Lord Matt, the President of Mexico is coming. What are you going to talk about? So I said, I tell you what, why don't we talk about chocolate? And she said, that's interesting, why chocolate? And I said, well, first of all, they invented it, the Aztecs invented it, and it's an aphrodisiac, and the Mexicans like to have a good party. So why don't we talk about chocolate? <laughs> so she said, fine, I'll go away and think about it. So she actually went to Colombia to learn a bit of Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and she came back, and she said, like, burst and I said, no oh, man, no oh, man, I've got the answer. It's two words. Just two words. So I said, fine, what are they, Nami? Um, que rico. Who, who here speaks Spanish? Yeah. Oh. Can you keep quiet, please? <laughs> I was told this meant very tasty. So that's that was fine. So put it in speech, no problems whatsoever. So it now gets closer and closer to the day when the, it's the first state visit I've ever been involved in. By God, it was going to be exciting. And we went to horse guards and... and, and the horse guards, there are only 14 people on this dais. It goes Cameron, Clegg, Theresa May, Lord Mayor, my two sheriffs, I'd have two sheriffs, Army, Navy, Air Force, Lord Lieutenant London, and the police. That's it. No one else there. Top left hand corner, uh, sort of box of thousands of paparazzi, sort of long lenses looking at every move you make. On the right hand side, you've got these wonderful cart horses with big drums as they bang their way in. And in front of you, there are 300 guardsmen and their busbies, and behind them, booze and rolls, horse guards, and the hearse will carry it back. I mean, it is just mind-blowing. Sun's shining, it, by God, you're proud to be British. And you sit there and say, oh, wow, aren't I lucky? And then the moment arises when the Bentley comes up. This maroon Bentley crunching across the gravel at about sort of five miles an hour, serenely coming in, and as she draws up, I forgot to tell you one thing, and that is that if you are married, you're allowed to stay in Buckingham Palace, and even like Carla Brun and Max Arcosi are not married, it's Windsor. Well, it just so happened the President and his wife were staying in Buckingham Palace, so the Queen knew what the President's wife looked like, and I can tell you. She was an absolute cracker. <laughs> so out gets the Queen, Prince Philip just behind her. And she comes down the line, she goes, Good morning, 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 good morning
And she turns at the top and comes back down again. And she stands in front of me. She says, Lord Mayor. Well, I see. Do you have any Spanish? So I said, I do have, have a couple of words, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do tell me, what are they? Well, uh, que rico, Your Majesty. Oh, she said, what does that mean? Very tasty, Your Majesty. Oh, she says, I hope you're not talking about the person's wife. <laughs> <laughs> It just gives you an idea, actually, that, you know, that they've got an extraordinary sense, a wonderful sense of humour. And, of course, it went on a little bit further, because I turned to Theresa May on my right, and I said, you know, have you noticed how demonstrative the President is? So she said, yes, I have, actually, because she was one of those chaps who shakes not with one hand, but two hands, and they actually, they hold you by the elbow. So it's one of those who's all very tactile. Of course, being with the royal family, being tactile is not a good idea. Being 89 years old, and the Australian carriage being about four foot off the ground, and only two people going into it, the Queen going first, I said to Theresa May, I said, it's going to be very interesting, because if she hesitates on the second step, there will be a temptation for the President to help the Queen into the carriage. <laughs> <laughs> and I promise you, and I, I haven't worked with me, there is a picture of Theresa May's face, just at the point when the Queen hesitates on the second step. The President's hands go up, and she makes the most wonderful face. And it's all over the papers the next day as well. It's fantastic. Anyway. <laughs> it didn't happen. It didn't happen. So, what is the summation of it? The answer is that, I have to say that Royal Wimbledon did a wonderful job. We had a, we had a run an appeal when you were Lord Mayor, and my appeal was uh, for men, cap and scope. But, uh, our problems with Max. And you guys, I mean, Robert, Julian, Chris, all of you, I can't mention, mention everybody, but you were all incredibly important. David, also, incredibly important for making that a wonderful day. This was the hottest day of the year. We had the HAC out in that armour. We raised 43,000 pounds net, which was fantastic. And can I just say, that was down to generosity. If I can just, just follow up, it was also the celebration of Gallipoli last year. And um, Gallipoli, as you all know, was a, was, a, was a disaster as far as the British were concerned. But uh, Jill and I had discussed for some time, actually, about the fact that we found that all our relations were getting married so late that they were asking all their friends for their weddings, and that all we were getting invited to were the funerals. So that we weren't actually seeing any of our relations except for when they were dying or the other ones that were dead. So we said, I'm going to have a party for my father for his 100th birthday. And he died 10 years before, but he would have been 100 had he been alive. <laughs> <laughs> but he'd been married three times and we had a chance to catch up with all the siblings. That's what we had. God knows how many step siblings. So it was a good idea to have the party. So we had the party. It was a fantastic success. And um, I was sitting next to Prince Philip at the time. And I was trying to work out actually how I was getting to the music. So I decided to go and tell this story. So I went through this process and I said, you know, so we had the situation where we had uh, this party. And I said, I was, someone came up and said, you know, we do the same thing for our great grandfather. So I said, what happened to him? He said, he had his left testicle shot off at Gallipoli. <laughs> <laughs> and all the doctors and nurses said, there's no way you can have any children. So we now have a party every 10 years with the project of the one testicle that worked. <laughs> and they call it the Gallipoli Ball. <laughs> now, I, I'm just, I, I, I've said enough, but I want to say one more thing, if I may, and that is that what you've got to remember is that when you're, effectively, if I can get my glasses off, uh, when, you're, when, you're, when you're Lord Mayor, you go through this called the silent ceremony, which is a completely silent uh, celebration of what's going on. And, oh, I can't get this on, I'm stuffed. Oh. <laughs> and the science survey takes place, and that's when you effectively get, you just get anointed effectively, just as John's been anointed just now. So we wrote this little poem. Some of you might recognise it. When the silent ceremony was over, so at the point, the most important thing is that you're treated like a king for a year, so you've got to remember, you must always remember, it goes to your head quite quickly because you're being very well looked after. But you must always remember that you're only the Lord Mayor. 
You're not Alan Garrett. You're not uh, you're not John. You're not you're not Simon. You're just the Lord Mayor. And you, the Lord, the Queen only knows you as the Lord Mayor. They don't, they don't know who you are. They just know you as the Lord Mayor. <laughs> the trouble is sometimes people forget this. So you've got to remind yourself all the time that that was one year and it ends. So there's a little poem here. When the silent ceremony was over, we were lying reflecting in bed. This is a story of some advice we were given, and we will never forget what was said. Lord Mayor is not just an office of tradition, where every need to succeed is supplied by a house that is home to deliver at a depth that Jilly and I were surprised. However, there will be a time when you're feeling important. There'll be a time when your ego's in bloom. There'll be a time when you take it for granted that you are without doubt the best qualified man in the room. <laughs> you hope that you feel when you're going might leave an unfillable hole, but just follow these simple instructions and see how they humble your soul. Take a bucket and fill it with water. Put your hand in it up to the wrist, put it out in the hole that's remaining is a measure of how much you'll be missed. <laughs> you can splash all you wish when you enter. You may stir up the water galore, but stop. And you'll find that in no time, it looks quite the same as before. <laughs> the moral of the story is quite simple. It's to do the best to show that you care. Be proud of yourself, but remember, there's no indispensable law there. Thank you very much. <laughs>